Welcome to week five in the NFL. Uh, it's amazing. We are already past the quarter pole. Feels like the season just started and uh, it's it's passing by quickly. This is the first week as we were looking through the schedule and we were trying to decide which games to preview. This is the first one where we saw a whole bunch of matchups where we were like, mm, don't know if I want to watch that. Uh, so we, we scrounged together the five best games or at least what we think should be the five best games this week. Uh, inevitably, a couple of them probably won't be, but we're hoping for uh, hoping for competitive affairs here. Uh, I, I would say the Sunday night matchup between uh, San Francisco and Dallas is, is the best one of the week, and of course, we will be talking about that. But before we get into these five games, EJ, how you doing? I'm good. I will take meh football over no football any day of the week, uh, any week of the year, as it may be. Um, I always think back to like the doldrums of summer and everybody's like, I wish there was a football game on. <laughs> and then we get to these weeks and it's like, oh, there's no great football games. on. Oh, you're going to complain about that now? No, no. I'm I'm happy that football's here. I'm happy that it's fall. And again, we think we know. Uh, we know we don't know. Some of these some of these games are going to be barn burners that we think we're going to be dogs and vice versa. But looking at the slate from sort of the top down, these are the five most interesting to us uh, before we get into them and get proven wrong by at least half of them. Because look, it's the NFL. (laughs) Nothing's actually predictable in this league. And that's what makes it so entertaining. Uh, reminder as we go game to game here, we are going to be filling out our underdog slip for this weekend. We have a, a five leg pick em going here and we'll reveal it pick by pick as we go with one player from each game. Uh, if you want to tail that slip, play along with us, of course, at the link in the description below, use promo code bootleg. They will match your deposit up to a hundred dollars. Uh, so whatever you happen to deposit, again, they will double it up to 100 bucks, and you can use that on pick'ems. You can use it on uh, not even just football, any sport. You know, we got uh, we still got baseball going right now. You know, it's up, it's playoff time uh, in, in baseball. We're going to have hockey and basketball once those get going. So uh, it's not just football. It's everything. Uh, again, promo code bootleg at the description below. Uh, let's get to our first game here, which on paper – should be kind of sneaky fun because the Rams are a sneaky fun team this year. Uh, definitely punching way above their weight class, what we thought their weight class was going to be back in the summer. That being said, I'm I'm not loving the matchup here in terms of scheme and talent at, at a lot of key positions. Um, if... The Rams have Cooper Cup in this one, and he's totally good to go. Obviously, that will change the game massively. But Sans Cooper Cup coming in and immediately being himself, um, this one kind of feels like a welterweight going against a heavyweight, and it might be over uh, fairly quickly. The balance that we've seen in the first four weeks out of the Rams, again, they're 2-2, two and two, but they've played well in every game, might come crashing down when you... When you go against the top talent in the league, and the Eagles are certainly that, sometimes that happens. Sometimes the the sort of Cinderella magic dust runs out, and you go, oh, they're just really good. They've got a ton of athletes. Howie's put together a great roster, and you know this isn't going to be the game we thought it was. Now, we've said that for several weeks with the Rams so far. Ah, this will be the week it'll fall off. This will be the week it'll fall off. Maybe they keep punching above their weight. That would be a great story. That would make it a sneaky, fun game. I'm with you. I think when the Eagles lean in, this one might be over. I don't know about quickly. I think the Rams right now are a very dangerous team. Um, They are playing well in the middle of a rebuild and in the middle of a youth movement. And that's very difficult to do in the NFL. That is rare. Typically, when you're doing these Nobody wants to call them rebuilds, so they call them everything, but they call them resets, they call them reloads, they call them re-everythings, but nobody wants to call it a rebuild. When you go young, when you jettison all your, you know, heavy, high price talent and you say, look, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna build the next crop, typically you're not competing every week. Um, you might steal a few games, but the Rams have been competing hard every week. It makes them a very dangerous team. Stafford makes them very dangerous, but um Let's talk about the Eagles offense first because it's uh, it's worth talking about. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's explosive, it's physical, it's it's rounding into, finally, it took a little while, but it's rounding into the form that we saw uh, at their peak last year. And I remember coming into this year when we were previewing the, the Patriots game week one, it was kind of like, okay, the, the teams that gave them the most trouble are the ones that played man coverage and played middle field close structures and challenged them and basically went right at their receivers with their DBs um, and challenged challenged hurts to hit these low percentage balls outside and that happened in the first couple of weeks you know teams challenged them heavily Mm -hmm. and the Patriots hung in there Uh, that being said we are starting to see with each passing week the Eagles hitting those quote-unquote low percentage balls (laughs) a lot more often and basically saying okay challenge accepted fuck you were the Eagles. And, you know, we saw that with A.J. Brown last week, just absolutely toasting Emmanuel Forbes. If that element of their offense remains consistent, that element of verticality, that element of we are just better than you on the outside, and then you also add in, you know, that big offensive line where anytime we get in a short yardage, it's an automatic first down, and, and how well they're able to run the ball with DeAndre Swift. At that point, there's really no answer. There's truly no answer. And I just I don't think the Rams overall have enough talent on defense to to handle that. Obviously, they have Aaron Donald, one of the greatest players of all time, still operating at his peak. He has the highest pass rush win rate out of any interior defensive lineman right now. He's still absurd. But around Aaron Donald, there's a lot of young guys that I just just like Emmanuel Forbes. I'm not sure they're ready for that which then puts a lot of pressure on Stafford and another young guy, Puka and Kyron Williams to keep pace with this Eagle Eagles offense. And I just, I, I think they're a year or two away from being able to do that. I just don't think there's enough bullets in that gun right now. Toe to toe. It's going to be very difficult. We talked a lot about AJ Brown on this week's review episode. Um, I went back to his next gen route chart. We're going to, we're going to throw that up on screen. AJ Brown, not a slot receiver. We talk about all these guys <laughs> like CD that like, oh yeah, and he floats inside. The matchups looks better. <laughs> like, take a look at that route chart, folks. That is an outside alpha wide receiver who is winning that way, and you know did so in pretty historic fashion. Uh, one of his best games of his career last week. That's great, but when you talk about the variety of weapons, uh, having two wide receivers in the top sixteen in the NFL for yardage through four games. And a running back who's second in the league in rushing yards? Why not? It seems pretty good. Is that good? Like <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> Three headed monster, right? And, you know, if you do lock down AJ Brown, which is a challenge, as we saw in and of itself last week, if you manage to do that, they've still got Devonta. They've still got Goddard. They've still got Swift. They've still got that huge offensive line with whoever. I mean, they haven't you know, shelved Gainwell by any stretch. They're still giving him carries. He's a quality guy. And this is the roster that Howie's assembled. There is quality at every level. There is quality at every second level. Um, You've got to come ready to play all day. You've got to play super well. And you have to get a little bit lucky because if the Eagles hit on half their stuff, they're still probably going to run away from you because they're just that good, just that talented. When I flip it over to the other side of the ball, uh, Rams off against Rams offense against Eagles defense, and again this game, this game will be determined, I think, by that matchup, just because it's about can the Rams keep up, right? Like we know the Eagles are going to get theirs offensively. Can the Rams keep up? Stafford's been playing excellent this year overall. Uh, had a couple bad balls against Cincy, which cost them the game, but overall Stafford's been great. Um, Puka's been outstanding. Kyron Williams has been great. The offensive line has played better than than we expected on paper. Um, But when I look at like scheme against scheme here, like how I think the Eagles are going to play them. I I do want to issue a caveat here. Again, it depends on if Cooper cups on the field, but schematically I'm not super in love with this matchup for the Rams. Um, If we look at how the Eagles defense operates, they don't play a lot of quarters. Like you would, you think that they would because they played a ton of quarters last year. They don't do that a lot now. It's mostly half quarter quarter or quarter quarter half, um, and uh, especially against uh, two by two structures, meaning two receivers on each side. You know, not 
being in trips, but in two by two, which the Rams are second in the NFL in, in being in two by two, like they they like having these balanced condensed formations so that they can make everything look the same. It's very very Sean McVay, right? Um, against those two by two looks, the Eagles either play cover three or quarter quarter half, depending on do you have a dude at receiver that we need to be worried about. You know, in the Minnesota game, they played a lot of quarter, quarter, half and half quarter, quarter, specifically with the half field safety being on the side of Justin Jefferson of like, we are going to put a cloud corner under him. We're going to put a safety over him, beat us with everybody else. Right. And uh, and uh, O'Connell had some really good play calls, play calls dialed up for that one. You know, the big touchdown to Jordan Addison, which was literally specifically designed to beat that coverage. Uh, Ironically, it was. very reminiscent of uh, a, a call that Sean McVay had against the Bears when uh, <laughs> when they played the same coverage in week one a couple of years ago, and McVay completely torched it. So we know McVay knows how to beat that, but at the same time, the reason why they play that is because the Eagles are, are very much in the vein of, we're going to take away your number one, if you have one, uh-huh. and make you beat us with everybody else. They did the same thing to Washington. A lot of quarter, quarter, half, and half, quarter, quarter against them because, of course, Terry McLaurin. But then you look at the Patriots game against two by two, it was mostly cover three because they weren't scared of anybody. So they're like, okay, we're going to take away the middle of the field. We're going to stop the run. We're going to play cover three, and and we're going to force you to make really tough throws outside the numbers. And the Patriots, for the most part, couldn't do it. I worry, for the Rams' sake, that if Cooper's not in this game, Cooper Cup meaning, that they're going to stick in cover three. They're going to force Puka to basically make a Herculean effort to win outside the numbers. They're going to clog up the middle of the field. You know, if he does run inside, we're going to have a guy to his left and a guy to his right, and we're going to crash on him immediately. I, I worry that unlike a lot of the other defenses that the Rams have played this year, that the Eagles are perfectly built from a schematic and talent perspective to stop what has worked for the Rams. And if they don't have Cooper Cup on the field to to be the Jefferson and be the McLaurin that can dictate coverage, again, talent for talent, I just don't think the Rams have enough here. So, again, we are recording this on a Wednesday. We don't know if Cup is playing. If he's not playing, I'm, I would be very surprised if, if the Rams found an answer for this. I'm not totally counting out Sean McVay because he's Sean McVay. <laughs> I just don't think there's enough there. Yeah, but strangely enough, it'll be another Jefferson that has to play pretty well. Van Jefferson, who's gotten some looks but hasn't completed enough of them to scare anybody yet. It hasn't been consistent in the fact that, oh, we've got to watch that guy, you know, one to three times a game because he's he's ripping off a big chunk. They've, you know, Stafford, again, has thrown it to him but they haven't really paid that off often enough that Philly should worry about it. Same thing with Tyler Higby. Tyler Higby's been more glue and less explosive play guy. Those two guys, especially if Cup's not in the lineup, are going to have to do it because the sort of de facto number two after Puka right now is 2-2, and the Eagles do have enough talent to roll to whatever the second option is. So if they shut off Puka, they're going to then go shut off Tutu and they're going to leave you one-on-ones for Van Jefferson, the Tyler Higbees of the world and say, go ahead, beat us with those guys. And the Rams haven't quite been able to light that match yet. So they would have to, um, it's not impossible. We've seen it happen before. It's what we would call unlikely. And we, when you say you don't like the matchup, those are the odds we're looking at. And okay, if they force them out of option 1A and 1B, our options 2, 3, and 4 going to be enough to put up points to keep with what is a very powerful Eagles offense. And we're like, maybe not quite yet. <laughs> it's, it's basically, you know, the question is, can the Rams – keep up with this Eagles offense specifically with options out of the backfield to Kyron Williams in space and speed outs underneath a a deep third corner and cover three to Puka. It's like, can you build an entire offense out of that? Because that's all they're going to give you, right? If they're sitting in cover three all day, that is literally all they're going to give you. Can you score 25 points off of that? 
I don't think they can. It's, so it's going to be tough. This means McVeigh is going to have to be the NFL version of MacGyver and make something with a freaking paperclip and some gum. Uh, if, if, he if McVeigh escape. wins this game, I, I swear to God, it's going to be one of the most impressive wins of, of his career. And he's won a Super Bowl. This would still be yeah. one of the most impressive wins if they pull this off. Yeah, the Rams offensive line, the, the complicating factor here is they've played pretty well. They haven't played anybody like the Philly D-line. Like the Philly D-line is a bunch of guys like the best guy they face in practice every day. <laughs> Yeah, like it's five of those guys and they come in waves and, you know, Stafford's been able to be back there and sling it really quickly and really accurately. He's not going to have the same kind of freedom typically that he's had. He's not going to have the same kind of time that he's going to have. He's likely going to take more hits than he has in past weeks. All of those things kind of add up to, again, decrease the window that the Rams have to operate for a successful you know, bid for a win here to a very narrow slice. And if they get outside that envelope, it's going to be tough sledding. Uh, my last note on this game before we move on, I, I mentioned earlier Aaron Donald has the uh, highest pass rush win rate percentage for an interior defensive lineman in the NFL at 25.7%, which is absolutely absurd. Uh, number two is also in this game, and that's Jalen Carter. He's at 23.1. So, yeah, they're basically going up against another Aaron Donald <laughs> in this game. He's... He's stupid good. He yeah. really is. The other thing is if Philly gets up in this game, like if they hit a couple early balls to A.J. Brown, get big chunks, score a couple, they can just drop into the run game. And right now in the run game, they are dominant. They are gaining 4.7 per rush and allowing 3.3. They have 43 rushing first downs, and they've allowed 15. They are just pounding teams on the ground so if you get behind and philadelphia goes into kill clock mode on the ground you're in trouble uh for my underdog slip i, I couldn't get any eagles numbers that i really 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 liked here for value and i definitely couldn't get any rams numbers that i really really liked for value <laughs> so i defaulted to the one thing that i know you hate you didn't which is it's me saying, okay, we think the Rams might get to the red zone, but we don't think they'll oh, score. No. So I'm taking Brett Maher you over one on and a half kicker. field goals. <laughs> oh, my God. I thought the thing was when you banged your head against the wall, it hurt, so you learned not to? Not I'm just you do it again. <laughs> <laughs> you are. You're betting on a kicker. All right. I'll just, we'll just duly noted, betting on a kicker, moving on. There was nothing else. There was nothing I, else. I, some, sometimes, much like this week when we were looking at the slate of games, sometimes there just isn't anything else. One thing really quick, and then we'll get right back to the show. It's not the holiday season yet, but we are getting there. Temperatures are starting to cool down, so the crew necks and quarter zips are coming out. And if you find yourself in the market for one of those, check out our sponsor for today, Viore. If you're watching the YouTube version of this show, I'm wearing one of their crew necks right now. This is in a burgundy-ish color that I picked out at one of their physical store locations near me, but obviously they do most of their business online. Their entire brand is all about creating clothes that you can be active in or go out in. Their activewear lines for both men and women are very extensive. They have everything for everyone who likes to hit the gym or go for a run or just do any physical activity whatsoever. But they also have a ton of different styles meant for the office or just lounging around on a chilly Sunday watching football. They make clothes for people of all sizes and body types, and as a big dude myself, I can attest to that. And the quality of each garment is really good in my experience. The stitching is really well done. The materials are comfortable, especially on the pants. I cannot recommend those enough. I've gone through about five to 10 washes so far on all of these clothes, and they've all held up great. So if you wanna buy something that will actually last you a long time and not just fall apart within a couple months, Viore is it. If you go through their catalog at viori.com slash filmroom, that's V-U-O-R-I dot com slash filmroom at the link in the description below. And if you find something you like, you can get 20% off your purchase, which is a pretty good discount. Again, that is 20% off your first purchase at viori.com, V-U-O-R-I dot com slash filmroom. Thank you once again to Viori for sponsoring this week's show and of course for that discount. And with that, let's get back to it. All right, Jags Bills, uh, our second game on the docket, and I I have similar feelings about this one. Where and, and I'll get to the numbers in a second after after you give your piece, but 
I don't like this matchup for the Jags at all. It is one of their worst matchups of the year. And that's beyond just saying, oh, the Bills are really good. Yeah, of course the Bills are really good. I'm talking from like a schematic perspective, a matchup perspective, like dude for dude on the field. This is not the team that I would expect the Jags to excel against. Like everything that the Jags are bad at, the Bills exploit. And everything the Jags are good at, the Bills are good at stopping. So if if there was a game where I think the Jags could potentially get rolled this year, which is not many of them, this mm. is probably one of them. It's It's like a nightmare matchup for them all across the board. And the timing couldn't be worse. We can talk about dudes for dudes and scheme on scheme and whatever else, but whether or not you believe in momentum within games, whether or not you believe in momentum within a season, like the Bills just played one of the best games they've ever played with Josh Allen at quarterback. It was one of Josh Allen's career games, and that's saying something. He's had some doozies. That is one of the most complete and explosive games he's played, and he played it against an opponent who is tougher. <laughs> than the Jags, mm -hmm. you know, bo on both sides of the ball. He was only playing their defense, but like their offense is a, is a tough matchup for the other offense as well. Cause a lot of times you're just forced to run to keep up. So the defense supported him, but he, uh, I don't want to say he matched their effort. I would say he even exceeded his own defense efforts. Like he was exceptional. So, you know, you just never want to catch the other guy when he is as hot as he could possibly be. And the Bills are red hot coming out of a victory that really counts for two because it's a division game. You know, their main rival in their division, they just smashed them and they looked really good on both sides of the ball doing it. The only thing that's sort of a niggling concern here is Bill's secondary really banged up again, which has been a story for the last couple of years running. The backups have been playing really well, but they are playing with backups again. We don't have final injury reports, but it doesn't look good. Obviously, Trey White's out for the whole year. Um, you know, and look, the Jags have some pretty good receivers. So there's an area they might be able to exploit. But even so, last week with those injuries, that secondary held up against the Miami receivers. And those are some of the most dangerous guys in the entire league. So even if that's your, again, sliver, crack, stick your foot in the door kind of a thing, you might get your toes smashed in this one. You know, you, you did have an interesting note of something that might give the Jags an advantage. You know, they played in London last week. They're staying there this week, so they're going to be on that time zone. You know, they didn't have to travel. They're, they're sticking out there. They're practicing out there. Um, I think the NFL threw them a bone of, like, here, do both London games back-to-back uh, -back and, and stay out there. So they will have an advantage from that standpoint but um that's that's about where their advantages end and when i when i look at uh let's say jags offense versus bills defense which is going to be you know the the main event here the jags have allowed the seventh most sacks um but they're eighth best in terms of pressure pres pressure percentage allowed right so if we're looking at pass protection which was a huge issue for miami against buffalo last week what that tells me is that their pass protection overall has been pretty good, but they're still allowing a lot of sacks because Trevor's been holding onto the ball and kind of slipping back into that, that hero ball habit that we were really, really annoyed at last year. He's not doing it as much as he did last year, but still, I would say one or two times a game, he's either throwing a ball that he really shouldn't, or he's holding the ball way longer than he should and taking a pretty bad, pretty bad sack. And, in a similar vein to Miami last week where it was we're trading touchdowns and we're keeping up and then all of a sudden they had one bad drive and then Buffalo just stepped on their neck. Trevor literally can't afford to make those hero ball mistakes in this game because if you make one mistake against Buffalo, they will absolutely bury you. They are an avalanche of a football team. And at the same time, this offensive line hasn't faced a pass rush like the Bills yet. Like, that Bills defensive line is ridiculous in terms of getting after the passer right now. Daquan Jones. Who knew? Daquan Jones. Nose tackle extraordinaire. <laughs> One of the highest pass rush win rates for any interior defensive lineman in the entire NFL this year. He got, like, seven pressures last week. Like, you just, you can't hold up against this D-line right now. So, even if there are holes to be exploited in a very injured secondary, I don't 
trust Trevor to be upright long enough to, to really exploit that. If there was ever a way to attack this Bills defense, it's going to be in some of the ways that Miami did last week with the run game. Like Miami actually ran the ball pretty well before things got out of hand, but mm -hmm. they showed once again that if there's a way to get after Buffalo, it's with outside zone. They're allowing, what was it, 8.6 yards per carry over the last three weeks uh, to, to outside zone. So not only is it the most common run concept that they've seen, but it's also the most effective run concept <laughs> against them. Huh, wonder why that is. <laughs> I know, right? But that's the going back that to works. last year, too. Yeah, like the Miami, thing that works, we're going to do it a lot. <laughs> Well, they did it last year, too. Yeah. Miami battered them with outside zone last year. Everybody battered them with outside zone last year. Like, they just yeah. couldn't stop it. And they still can't stop it. And so, on paper, you think, oh, well, the Jacks will just do that. They'll take the pass rush out of the game by running the ball. You know, they'll protect Trevor from himself by running the ball. And then you look at it, and it's like, oh, they get three and a half yards per carry on outside zone. And they barely run it to begin with. Oh, the one thing that could be their saving grace, they're bad at shit okay uh, so what are you left with Nothing. yeah it's, it you're right and it has been very bad they're 31st in run blocking and that's the composite nfl rating so you take uh, there's a couple of different ratings for nfl offensive lines and you take those and average them they've been 31st um bad like without a doubt they are getting cam robinson back um, that'll help. He is a good run blocker. It's not going to make them like 15th overnight, um, but they might be able to run to his side a little bit more, a little bit more better than they have in the past. And, you know, ETN we know can exploit even some pretty small holes, but yeah, if that's what you're hoping for is that the Jags are going to mount a really effective ground game against this Bills defense and, and that's what you're pinning your hat on, oof. Not not great. I I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't bet the farm on that one. My worst fear is that at least worst fear for the Jaguars is that Buffalo goes up early. Yeah, and Trevor. I love Trevor. I want to preface this by saying I love Trevor. He's amazing. Yeah, but he has so much Josh Allen to him, where sometimes he gets in this mindset of like. I'm going to fix it, guys. And then he'll make it worse, right? Again, he'll take a bad sack. He'll throw a bad pick. And it's it's like, pl just play within the offense, please. Like, you are so talented. You are so smart. You're so gifted. Play within the offense. If it's not there, throw the ball away. Don't be a hero. You will make it worse, you know? And my worst fear is that they go down early and then Trevor gets into his, I'm going to fix it mode. And then it snowballs from there. That could end up being a disastrous day for Jacksonville. And it, I I just, I don't know, man. I don't like the feeling. Uh, yeah, it's frustration-based. And we've talked about this over the last two seasons many times, that NFL defenses are moving to a frustration basis, right? Mm -hmm. That we've got, you know, two high safety structures, and we are going to force you to make as many plays as we can in every drive we are going to limit your explosives we are going to rally and tackle downhill we are just going to like grind and grind and grind and we're going to you know really play on that feature of two you know very successful young quarterbacks here talking about both josh allen and trevor the way to get to them has been that way frustrate them frustrate them frustrate them make them say hey i'm going to go for the big thing here or i need to go for the big thing here then they make an error and you take advantage, even though they're very talented. And it's frustration based. It's not saying you can't throw that ball. It's saying we're not going to allow you to throw that ball. We're going to throw a leash on you and see how long you can take it before you chafe and kind of explode and do the bad thing, because then we can profit most likely. Um, occasionally, you're just going to go, you know, superhero and go off and we'll lose. But more often than not, we're going to win when we frustrate you into those decisions. I'm not saying that Trevor can't go off because he's Trevor. No, he can, but it's less likely when he gets into that mode. I'm with you. And same thing yeah. with Josh, right? We, we don't want to see Josh there either. It's less likely that we see Josh there in this game, but that's his weakness too. That's his Achilles heel. They share it, right? Get pushed into that frustration, take the offense on their back, say, I've got to do it myself. And then they start whipping the ball up and turnovers happen, drive stall, and... 
that shifts the advantage to the defense. And that's what the defenses are trying to do is just play it out and frustrate them. I think the best thing for Jacksonville is if their own Josh Allen, who's having a tremendous year, he's got a bunch of sacks so far, as well as their corner duo of Campbell and Darius Williams. By the way, shout out Darius Williams. He's been having a phenomenal season so far. One of the best corners in the NFL through the first month. Like, easily, he's been tremendous. If that defense can just stabilize this game and make it as boring as possible in the first half, that's that's a win for me. Like make it make it boring in a slugfest where if Jacksonville ain't scoring, make sure the Buffalo ain't scoring, right? Because the the best thing they can do is keep it close and allow Trevor to just settle, right? Just get just get settled. And I again, same thing goes for Buffalo too, because we know how Josh can be. But it it really is all on the Jags defense to to stem the tide early in order to keep their quarterback from from being himself. You know, it, it, <laughs> which I know sounds like a very mean no. thing to say about Trevor Lawrence. I think he's one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. But, like, it, cadence, the cadence of the game matters a lot for both of these guys. It really does. Yeah, it's Jekyll and Hyde. It's not mean. It's there are two sides to these guys, and they're very talented. And it, all, it goes back to, like, capacity is just capacity it's not capacity for good or capacity for evil they both have great capacity if it goes the good way they're very difficult to stop if it goes the bad way they are actively hurting their team so you just have to again like you said keep them calm keep them centered make sure that things don't get out of hand and then you know ease them with game plan and situation into that good version of themselves and and then hopefully we'll get to see a great game yeah, if the Jacksonville defense can turn a couple of would-be touchdowns by the Bills into field goals, um, keep it within, you know, I would say 10 at the half, you know, basically a one-score game to get back into it. Like, that's that's good. That's a good place for them to be, and we should see a decent second half with some adjustments. And, yeah, maybe they come out. Josh Allen, you mentioned him. That's the pass rusher, not the pass thrower. Um, tied for the league, league in sacks, I believe – Tell me if I'm wrong in our AFC South wrap up that I picked him for my AFC South defensive MVP. I think so. I mean, there wasn't a whole I, lot of great names to pick no, from. No, but, it's not. But I think you did. <laughs> not one of the divisions we struggled with, but I, I felt like he was prime. He had a good half, a uh, back half of last year. Um, I thought he would build on that momentum. He has again through the first month. And he's had some pretty good games in the past against the other Josh Allen. Uh, so he's going to need one of those again. They're going to, again, the Jags are going to need every advantage to try and keep up with what is one of the hottest teams in the NFL right now. Uh, for the underdog slip, the second name uh, that we have on this pick and it's the name that I chose from this game, was Travis Etienne. However, because of the uh, the issues with run blocking that I pointed <laughs> out before, uh, I have lower on 62.5 rushing for Etienne. Um, this is not... Not the game that I expect him to pop off. He does have the talent. You know, he's all, he's one of these guys where it's like one carry can can give you the over because he's got speed and explosiveness and all that. But, you know, looking at, at how Buffalo um, how Buffalo has handled uh, most other types of runs other than outside zone, because, again, Jags don't run outside zone. They run mostly inside zone. And looking at how Buffalo handles inside zone, they usually bottle that up pretty darn well so I just I don't see Travis Etienne being able to exploit them in the same way that Devin uh H-Han thank you uh for the comments for confirming that it is H-Han <laughs> apparently that's coming from H-Han himself um yeah. but uh yeah I don't I don't see him exploiting them the same way that H-Han did just because I think the the run schemes for each team are different yeah, I like that one. I like that choice on the slip because I think what they will do is turn some of those carries into targets instead. And Etienne is the clear leader, combined touches and targets for the Jags offense. He's got 85 combined touches and targets, so pass targets and 
run touches through four games. That is well more than anybody else on that team. So I think they might just kind of transition and say, hey, handing it off to you is not working, so we're going to try and get you free against Terrell Bernard. We're going to try and get you free against Milano. Easier said than done, but decent matchup, again, because he is a very good and explosive pass receiver. They might just kind of morph some of those run touches into pass targets. All right, let's get to arguably the main event of the week. Cowboys, 49ers, battle for NFC supremacy going on here. Um, Other top NFC teams, I'm sure, will be watching this game with great interest because it will go a long way to determining playoff seeding. All these teams are going to see each other again in January, but uh, this game will, will probably determine what stadium they're playing in. Looking at this game, and I was going through a bunch of numbers, and I was going through a bunch of tape. And I, I tweeted this out earlier today before we recorded this. Both of these teams are nightmare matchups for each other. Like, mm-hmm. they, they do not match up well against each other offensively at all. Um, if either of them crack 20 points, I would be surprised. If you had to ask me who's going to win, I would say I have no idea. I just know it's not going to be by a lot. Because neither of these offenses, to me is a good matchup for either of these defenses. I think this one might crack open. And on paper, I see a lot of reasons to think, just like you do, that this is going to be a slugfest. It's going to be very close. It's going to be even. The matchups are not ideal. I went back just to give a little historical context and set this game up. And, you know, we saw the Cowboys live on Sunday, and they destroyed there's no other word for it. A pretty hapless Patriots team in Dallas. And they look good doing it. They were rolling. Um, the Niners ain't the Patriots. <laughs> so, And the Cowboys <laughs> have to do this on the road as well. So Cowboys were 8-1 and one at home last year, but they were 4-4 four and four on the road. So if they were fallible anywhere, they're 500 on the road. They are a much less formidable team away from AT&T. The Niners, on the other hand, have been rolling and I swear to God, for being such a good football team, the Niners are the easiest team to forget for being really, really successful. Mm -hmm. They're 4-0 this season. If you remove the loss to the Eagles last year that we saw when we were down at Shrine Bowl in January, this is the one where Brock Purdy got hurt and a bunch of other Niners got hurt, and they got rolled out of the playoffs, right? Just bad timing. If you take that game away, the last time this team lost was October 23rd, 2022 to the Chiefs. It's outrageous. That's the last really time is. this team lost outside of losing their starting quarterback in the playoffs and just catching a hottie, like, done. They are so good, <laughs> have been for so long. They've scored 30 points, in, at least 30 points in every game. In fact, they scored exactly 30 points for the first three weeks. They scored more in week four. They've allowed seven 23, 12, and 16 in four games this year. They are the modern version of a juggernaut. Like, we keep saying, oh, this might not work, or this might not work, or this guy's out, or Ayuk's out, or Kittle's not going to play, or the line's banged up, or who knows, Purdy's not that good, blah, blah. All they do is roll up 30 and allow in the teens. And they have Mm -hmm. since literally before Halloween last year. Like, they're so freaking good that... I think the Cowboys on the road might be thinking, hey, we just smashed the Patriots. They're a tough football team. Typically they are. They certainly weren't on Sunday. They they could get mollywopped in this one. Like they this could get out of hand. Is it gonna? No. Like there's a lot of talent on the Cowboys side as well. And if Dak comes in and plays hot, could be one of those, you know, for four and four on the road last year, could be one of those four they won. Um, but this is going to be an extremely tough test. And again, if the Niners open it up early, it's going to be really difficult because that defense is really good too. They're kind of like the Bills and the fact that they're playing really well on both sides of the ball. This isn't about having a great offense or a great defense on the other side, just holding it up. Like they can hurt you and do hurt you either way. Not a fun team to try and come back on. The Cowboys offense versus Niners defense matchups intrigues me because, um, they're both really good at certain things and really inept at certain things. You know, like, for instance, the Niners are really good at keeping you out of the red zone. They only allow two red zone trips per game, which is fourth best in the NFL. But once you're in the red zone, 
they allow you to score fairly easily. It's like 66% uh, red zone TD percentage, uh, eighth worst in the NFL off the top of my head. Um, the Cowboys, meanwhile, are the best team in the NFL at getting to the red zone. So, again, strength yeah. on strength here in terms of between the 20s and getting chunk plays. And, and they've actually done a really good job of of just using CD and moving him around. Um, you know, getting Pollard involved in the run game, getting chunks, you know, using Ferguson on third down. Like, it, they're a very, very good offense between the 20s, you know, getting down to the red zone. Um, 4.8 trips per game, which is best in the NFL. However, just like the Niners, once they get into the red zone and space is compressed, they're really, really shitty. Uh, if I recall, hold on, I have the number right here. So it's just under 37%. Uh, red zone TD percentage, which is 30th in the NFL over the last uh, four games. Over the last three, it's at 26%. They actively got yeah. worse after the week one game against New York, right? Um, which was 40 to nothing. So that game is, is very abnormal. But over their next three, they were at 26%. So this is a very good offense between the 20s versus a very good defense between the 20s versus a really bad offense in the red zone versus a really not great defense in the red zone. Who's going to win there? I got no idea. I really have no idea. Uh, it's, it's, it's just so hilarious to me how both good and how bad these teams match up against each other for stuff like that. You know, it it, it makes picking this game extraordinarily hard to do. Creativity from the Cowboys has been lacking inside the twenties, and when you lose that space, when you get the compressed space in the red zone, typically the way you have to. Uh, basically balance out for that is with creativity you've got to use some really interesting formations um another team we're going to talk about coming up next the colts are doing a really good job of that this year in terms of hey we don't we're not just gonna you know we're not just gonna out duel you guy on guy you know the classic hey we're gonna line up one receiver to one side against your best corner we're gonna throw a fade and may the best man win uh, uh the best red zone offenses don't rely on that because that's actually a fairly low percentage play in terms of yield like they come up with plays that are quick hitting and have like three options and you know yeah. they count on their quarterback to make the correct read really quickly and take the easy one because you probably can't cover all three cowboys have been more of the former like hey we're gonna line somebody up and just try and run you over we're trying to get that one-on-one matchup on the corner and throw the speed out and you know, defenses, most defenses are decently prepared for that. And we're seeing, you know, commensurate results from the Cowboys. One quarter of the time they get in the red zone, they score. It's you know what Indies is, by great. the way? A lot better. 73%. They're third in the NFL. Like, yeah. Steichen is awesome. Steichen <laughs> is so good. <laughs> go back and look at what he did last last week in the red zone specifically. Um. Uh, I think it was our buddy Ted Wen who writes for The Athletic, highlighted one play that uh, is a PRO. Yeah, that's pass run option. That means pass comes first. So the first option you're looking for is pass, and there's run option, but there's two run options. One is hold it, uh, you know, and the quarterback can run it because you've got Anthony Richardson. The other one is hand it off to the back. Um, and so it's first read pass and then coming in on the same side so again quarterback doesn't have to change focus it's reading a defender for a run option as a second point and there's there you're not going to get three right answers so if the quarterback mm -hmm. chooses correctly you're going to score and that's what you need in the red zone the cowboys haven't shown that kind of creativity uh flipping over to the other side niners offense versus cowboys defense um and i i did a bunch of work on this one uh, as well trying to figure out like you know who who actually has the advantage here like can anybody slow down this 49ers offense the Cowboys I do think can mm -hmm. um you know they they're another team the 49ers uh, another team that you know runs a lot of condensed formations a lot of two by two this is not a team that lines up and spreads people out in trips like they are they are very much a Kyle Shanahan type team <laughs> Everything's packed in tight, lots of motion, run it down your throat. Everything looks the same. Here comes play action. Like it's, it's very, very Kyle Shanahan as, as you would expect, right? He's the coach. Um, and so I was looking at how the Cowboys play against that. 
Um, I was looking at specifically snaps against two by two, both with motion and without motion on early downs, as well as on third downs. And I was like, just how do they respond to that? How do they play against that, that style? Typically it's going to be man coverage about 40% of the time. And then another 37% in cover three. So it's middle field, close structures, lots of bodies down there, you know, flying in the backfield, trying to get tackles for loss in the run game, you know, being, you know, prioritizing the run over everything else, especially because that's going to set up everything in a Kyle Shanahan type system. Um, I'm fascinated to see how they handle all the motion. You know, if they stick to all of that man coverage, especially now without digs, I'm sure that changes the complexion of things. Even with Bland playing so well, not having digs matters. So I'm curious to see if that 40% goes down a little bit, but I'm sure they're going to try. Um, and then specifically with that run defense against outside zone, which we know the Niners run more than more than most other teams. Other than a couple big runs where they happen to be in cover two in some of these blowout games, you know, uh, against the Giants and, and against the Patriots, other than a couple of, of times where they caught him in cover two, this has been a very good team against outside zone, especially from the formations and personnel groupings that the 49ers emphasize. You know, they will sit there all day in those bare fronts with those five-man surfaces and they will say, we are better than you up front. Mm -hmm. I dare you to beat us. There's been like two runs the entire year against these middle field close structures from these personnel groupings that have actually popped, and it's been for like 11 yards, right? There was one against Arizona where uh, the backside edge just stepped in the buck a little bit, but again, it was like 11 yards. Like, who cares? They're not getting these explosives run against them like Buffalo, uh, who's running a lot more too high structures. So pretty much the only thing that has consistently punished them is counter at about six and a half yards per carry. I would imagine Kyle's going to try to lean into that because I don't think they're going to get a whole lot on outside zone. But if they can't make counter work and they can't make outside zone work, now I don't know what you do, right? Because again, this is a team that's going to play a lot of man coverage and a lot of cover three. We're going to clog the middle of the field. We're going to make Brock Purdy make really tough throws outside the numbers. We haven't necessarily seen Purdy in a game where he was forced to do that a lot yet. I'm not saying he can't do it, mm -hmm. but we haven't seen him, you know, have to rip a whole shot behind a hang corner from the far hash, right? You know, yep. which is that might be like the only thing that they're willing to, to give him and say, go ahead, make that throw. We haven't necessarily seen him do that uh, consistently. So... If they take away the run game, which I think the Cowboys are perfectly capable of doing, can Brock Purdy put this team on his back? I'm not saying he can't, but I'm I'm not 100% sure that he can either, if that makes sense. Like, I'm not trying to talk shit on Brock mm -hmm. Purdy, but this is a team that has not ever in his era played in a game where he had to take it over this one might be a game that he has to take over. It's possible. I think the Cowboys are going to have to play exceptionally well to get to that point because there's a lot of other options. There's a bunch of other dominoes that have to get knocked down um, before we get to that point. And usually teams sort of run out of answers before that happens with the 49ers. We don't get all the way to that point. To your point, we haven't seen it before. There's a reason for that because uh, something else has worked and typically the Niners have won those games like, all of them, <laughs> which is literally crazy all because, of them, <laughs> because if you talk about when Purdy took over, like they've been winning since slightly before that and have continued it till now, like literally, except for one game he got knocked out of, which it's very hard to count that against him. Like every other game, they've found a way with Purdy quarterback and usually in convincing fashion. This is not a team that had a lot of those squeaker wins is, you know, playing in a lot of three point games that this team wins convincingly and has for a long time now. So yeah, if they can get him to that point, good on them. Like it is possible they can, they will have done a lot of things right. And then we'll see. I don't think they probably get there. Um, they did get there with Mac and Mac was clearly not up to the task on Sunday. I will also say that Brock Purdy ain't Mac Jones. 
No, he's, he's way better. better. He's better yeah. than that. So even if you get there, even if you get to that isolation moment and say, okay, Brock, and Brock goes to work taking whatever's left, which he is really good at. He is very good at taking what the defense gives. Um, he is well-schooled as a Shanahan disciple. Um, he, I might even say he's Kyle's brightest boy. Like Kyle's tried this with a lot of guys before him and Brock does it better than any of them, which is why Brock's playing right now and is the anointed starter of the 49ers. And the reason the 49ers are rolling because he is an extension of his head coach and does what he wants very, very well. And so Kyle tolerates him <laughs> more yeah. than all the others before him. Um, so it's going to be, I think it's going to be a stiff challenge on the road for Dallas. Uh, if they win this game, going to be a large feather in your cap. Like you said, this is a likely playoff matchup come, you know, January. And, you know, they will have figured out a way to put a chink in the armor, which no other team besides, you know, the Eagles, based on not having the quarterback, uh, have been able to do in almost an entire year. That's that's a lot of consistency in a league that is not very consistent. In terms of uh, what I have for my underdog pick em slip here, I went with George Kittle over 41 and a half receiving. And the reason why I did that is, again, if we're going to see a bunch of cover one and a bunch of cover three, mm-hmm. Kittle is often their their answer for those types of coverages because how many linebackers and how many safeties can actually cover him in man? It's a very small list. And in cover three, you know, he's, again, exceptionally smart in terms of reading space uh, and, and settling in the exact right spot that he needs to be in, you know, if he's running a seam route, he knows how far he should take it before he's about to get his head taken off or, you know, how much space he needs to clear vertically and laterally to give Brock a, a good throwing window uh, against all those cover three looks. Like, um, I I would say that other than Travis Kelsey, there is no better tight end at mm. just finding space against zone. And he's also just as hard to cover Travis, hard to cover as Travis against man as well. So uh, I would say that that Kittle is the guy for this game. If I had to peg one, you could talk me into Ayuk as well. Again, because he's <laughs> really? extremely. I, I know, shocker. I I could talk Brett Coleman into <laughs> Brandon Ayuk. Wow, I shoo! It just must be my day or something. But in terms of favorable numbers, I feel like Kittle's number is favorable. I mean, again, Br- I, I would agree. If you if you said, "Oh, Brandon Ayuk's going to get eighty yards in this game," I'm not going to tell you no. <laughs> That's my guy. You're never, but you're never going to tell me Kittle's the no, easier one. Kittle's the easier. Kittle is is the, the easier one. And in terms of matchup, you said not many guys, but J. Ron Curtis is really good against tight ends. Um, Kittle is a tough matchup, one of the toughest in the NFL. But J. Ron Curtis is one of those equalizer type players. You know, uh, Damone Clark. Not as much. I really like Damone Clark, but I don't like him as a matchup against Kittle. Vander Esch can be exploited in the same way, especially in more man concepts. Um, he's not gonna. He's not gonna keep with George. Uh, Jaron Curse might be the guy if I was, you know, Cowboys DC and saying, okay, on certain downs we're gonna, you know, we're basically gonna man you up. You know, some defense call uh, coordinators call that ace. Like you're, you're it. You're the ace. Like wherever he mm-hmm. goes, you go. Like just. Certain plays, it's going to be curse on Kittle, and we'll just live with the results. Uh, you know, better than better than average odds, uh, better than normal odds, I would say, for most people that are trying to do that. Um, but still, I like Kittle, so I'm not I'm not upset with this slip so far, except betting on a kicker. <laughs> it's okay. One day it will work. <laughs> <laughs> just like betting on Ayuk. Yeah. One day, one day, one day. Uh, all right, Chiefs Vikings. Um, speaking of amazing receivers mm. uh, against amazing corners, this is going to be the Trent McDuffie versus Justin Jefferson show, a matchup that I have been eagerly awaiting for weeks at this point because Jefferson, by most people's account, is the best receiver in the NFL, and McDuffie, so far at least, has played at minimum like a top three to four corner in the NFL, if not the best corner in the NFL so far. Uh, He has been absolutely phenomenal so far this year. And this is a very man-heavy defense for Kansas City. Very, very man-heavy. More man-heavy than you would think uh, compared to past Spagnuolo defenses, you know, where it was a lot of quarters, a lot of cover two, and, and 
never cover three. They they pretty much never play it. But it, it, it's <laughs> they're 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 substituting more of the quarters in cover two this year for straight up man coverage because they feel like they have the dudes to do it. And McDuffie is obviously the leader of that pack. I would expect that we are going to get some kind of shadow situation here because who else do you trust against Jefferson mm-hmm. other than McDuffie? And whoever wins that matchup, that one-on-one matchup, I think is going to determine overall who wins this game. Because mm-hmm. if they can get away with that, right? If they can get away with banishing Jefferson to McDuffie Island, or at least as close as they can get to it, that means that, okay, we can we can make a, we, we can have a safety over the top of Jordan Addison so that he doesn't get his weekly 60-yard touchdown, right? Um, we can we can afford to have a bracket on Hawkinson on third down. Um, if, if Jefferson is winning that matchup and they're forced into calling other stuff, whether it's straight up one double jersey number, uh, or if they're forced into retreating, quote unquote retreating, into more zone coverages because McDuffie isn't up to the task, that completely changes the complexion of the game because now all of those zone beaters in O'Connell's playbook that do kind of like force you <laughs> into, into opening things up for Addison deep down the field and, and force you into just hoping that Hawkinson catches six balls instead of 13. You know, <laughs> I, I just, I think that, that that matchup in particular has so many different effects on the rest of this game because the coverage will be dictated by who wins that one-on-one. If you had to ask me who is going to win it, I would lean Jefferson, but if there's anybody in the NFL right now who could survive one-on-one, it's Trent. Spags is not going to leave him on McDuffie Island a lot. Now, by a lot, that's a relative term. Percentage-wise, he may, but Spagnuolo typically changes things up throughout the game and makes offenses guess that way that's one of his greatest success points is that he will say all right on this on this down he's on mcduffie island on the next one we're gonna go high low on the next one we're leaving a cloud corner and yeah mcduffie's gonna be you know in that coverage but not the coverage and he's gonna he's gonna make sure there's at least three or four rotating coverages so that o'connell has to guess Right. He, he's not always getting the same thing, because if you give O'Connell this whatever, the same thing straight, he's going to beat you. He's going to adjust. Mm-hmm. He is that good offensively. And Spags doesn't want that. So he's going to throw the grab bag at you. And yes, there are going to be at least a handful of snaps where it is straight up one on one Jefferson and McDuffie. And that is that is pure popcorn stuff like, yes, yes, please. I want to see those. Um, But it's those other coverages as well. And whether or not O'Connell guesses right for what's coming. And that's a tough thing to do. But the rest of this defense has been playing really, really well as well. And we, you know, lauded them as one of the top defenses in the NFL. Top three, I would say, is very safe, um, depending on what your metrics and measures are. And, you know, again, even against the... uh, rejuvenated Zach Wilson, (laughs) who was playing the lights out. You know, he was being super accurate, and that's not something we've had the chance to say very much, but he was. They still only gave up 20. Like, that's not even three touchdowns. Technically, it might have – technically, it was 18, right? Because I think one of those was a safety. Yeah. So, So, even better. (laughs) Overall, this is a very good defense, and it is built to give Minnesota fits. And – we're going to have to see that sort of preternatural connection between O'Connell and Kirk. We're going to need a microwave Kirk type performance for them to keep with it. Cause I do not expect that on the other side, the chiefs are going to bumble on offense for a second straight week. I would never bet that Pat Mahomes is going to play really average football for, you know, two straight games that looks like that, um, you know, short of an injury. So again, Minnesota can, they're going to have to, kind of come out with all their guns blazing use all those weapons effectively guess correctly on the coverages take their shots when they can they're basically gonna have to pull all the right levers against what is a very tough defense and has been throughout the entire year and kansas city's got the dudes like like you said they're changing their coverage patterns because those young those guys that were young defenders last year and learning 
learned their lessons last year and have come out blazing. Chris Jones is still Chris Jones. Derek Nottie's doing his thing in the middle. Like, but we've talked about Nick Bolton. We talked about him early in this season that he has come along as a linebacker and is now much more complete than when he was drafted. Like, this is a tough nut to crack. This KC defense is not just going to give you anything, regardless of the talent you have. And Minnesota certainly has a ton of talent on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, I I also want to make a comment about Patrick Mahomes in the in the performance that he had uh, last week, you know, because it, it was arguably the worst game of his career, or at least one of the worst games of his career, right? Yeah, and bottom so three. People are people are uh, there, there's just kind of weird narrative around this game where it's like, well, if if the Vikings can force Mahomes into the same mistakes that the Jets did, then they're easily going to blow him out. And it's like, first of all. <laughs> Mahomes doesn't have those two games in a row or doesn't play that yeah. game two games in a row, right? If he if he has a bad game, which is exceptionally rare, very rarely does he ever stack those on top of each other. Secondly, the Vikings defense is not the Jets defense. They were harassing him like crazy and forcing him into making very un-Mahomes-like decisions. If you look at the pass rush win rate, which again, the pass rush for the Jets was was really the the factor there that that kind of sped up his clock and made him make some really dumb throws. Um, the Jets' pass rush win rate is fifth in the NFL at fifty one point eight percent, which is obscenely high. The Vikings are the fourth worst at thirty two point seven percent. So no, these defenses are not the same. Uh, nope. They will not quote unquote rattle Mahomes like the Jets did. They will not force him into terrible decisions like the Jets did. If the Vikings are going to win this game, it is going to be in a shootout kind of way, not a defensive battle kind of way. Because, sorry, the Vikings defense ain't anything close to the Chiefs defense, at least not so far this year. Yeah, the Vikings defense against lower tier offenses like the Bucks, and we'll talk about the Bucks in a minute, but, uh, you know, or in future podcasts, actually, Bucks have been doing better than expected, but they're. They're, they're not still a superpower offense. And the Panthers, the Vikes D gives up 20 or less. That looks really good. Against higher-powered attacks like the Chargers and the Eagles, they give up four TDs or more, 34 and 28 are the, the scores they gave up to the Chargers and the Eagles. So uh, the Chiefs, I would put in the latter category, a higher-powered offense, um, you know, <laughs> helmed, helmed by one Patrick Mahomes with a very competent run game. We talked about Pacheco in our recap this week. And, you know, yeah, their receivers have not been tremendous. But again, Vikings defense has come to play much more so against, you know, the Palookas of the league than the elites. And Chiefs offense, call it what you will, it's changeable, but it's still in the elite category in this league. And elite offenses have made this defense look pretty pedestrian. It's uh, it's one of those games where it's either going to be weirdly very tight, mm. which would be so Vikings, right, for this game to go down to the last <laughs> play. It would be so Vikings. Or they're going to get rolled. There is no in-between. I, I, I don't yeah. see this being like a 10-point a, a you know, game where the Chiefs are just pulling away late or something like that. It's either this one's a nail biter that both fan bases absolutely despise because their their heart, you know, goes through the roof, or Vikings fans turn it off by the third quarter. I I just I don't see anything in between. If Kirk comes out, let's just say cool, <laughs> not on microwave status. If he does not come out hot and, and rearing, and he can do either, he is famously one or the other, hot or cold. If he comes out a little cold in this one, look, the Chiefs defense is too good. The Vikings are not going to be able to keep up. Their defense is most likely not going to say, hold on, Kirk, we'll hold you up today. We got it. No problem. <laughs> like that's, that's not likely to happen. If the, if, if the offense in purple doesn't come out lighting it up and putting up numbers um, and trying to challenge the Chiefs that way, if they're not able to do that, either because the Chiefs defense is just really good or the Vikes offense comes out flat, like, yeah, this one, the air could go out of this particular balloon in a hurry. Uh, one more note that I, I forgot to mention earlier um, in regards to the, the Chiefs defense being very man heavy, right, and, and trusting their guys. That also extends to linebackers and safeties, too. And, and they trust their guys to, to cover tight ends who a lot of the time tight ends, it's, it's, you know, 
get open, run option routes. You got sure. you got choice routes galore. Find leverage, work against the leverage. You know, it's it's stick routes all day, every day. Which are really tough to cover. <laughs> you know, like if you're going up against like a six five frame and, and you're sitting inside leverage and then he's just pivoting and running away from you and then the balls falls out immediately and you gotta reach across this big six five frame to break it up. Like it's it's tough, right? And uh, so if you're playing that much band coverage against a position that A, is bigger than you, and B, has the freedom to just go run to space. That is the main reason for me why, when I'm looking at this underdog slip, I'm putting in TJ Hawkinson higher than 53 and a half because, let's just say, McDuffie <laughs> locks up Jefferson. Sure. And they're playing a bunch of man coverage because they can, because McDuffie's locking up Jefferson. Where do you think the ball's going on third and six? It's going to be TJ Hawkinson. And then it'll be Hawkinson again, and Hawkinson again, and Hawkinson again. Seven yards at a time, baby. We're going to get to 53 and a half. I, I would bet a, a significant chunk of money on that. And this offense does that. Like, there are a lot of offenses where you'd say it should go to the tight end on that down and distance, and they don't for one reason or another. Cough, cough, Atlanta. But, <laughs> like, this offense does throw to Hawkinson a lot early often they feature him in this offense they traded for him for a reason and they are using him and it's cool to see so again sticking with you it's just betting on kickers man we'll get there trust i know me. we're good. okay we're good. <laughs> trust trust me he says about betting on kickers i love it i never get these underdog slips wrong ej why would you have no faith i, in me? You, I you're <laughs> right right we're just mm-hmm. yes all right, last game of the day, Titans Colts. Um, you know, I I feel like until further notice, we're just gonna watch Anthony Richardson every single week just to see what crazy shit he does this time. Because every time I watch Anthony Richardson, he does crazy shit. Like he is one of the most exciting players, not just quarterbacks, players in the NFL. And we're like four games into his career. I love this kid. Leads the league in explosive play rate. That's for all players, not just quarterbacks, for all players. Like, he is lightning in a bottle. Uh, Colts games are going to be roller coaster affairs, like we said, uh, again, on a recap. that he, It's a thrill ride. He's not going to do it in a traditional way, whether that's rookie or anything else. He is something special. He is worth watching. He is incredibly capable, certainly much more so than a lot of people gave him credit for uh, in the pre-draft process, uh, makes this offense, especially when pairing with his rookie head coach, Shane Steichen, who we threw some flowers at earlier. This is a fun combination. This is, yeah, I'm with you. This is must-see TV. These are must-watch games to see what Steichen's drawn up, what Richardson does with it, because half of it's what got drawn up and half of it's the craziest freaking ad lib you've ever seen, um, but it works. <laughs> Uh, tremendous physical talent. Hope he stays healthy. He's already been banged up a little bit. And the Titans DL absolutely abused Burrow last week. So I said during our recap that I hadn't gone back because um, we weren't talking about that game, that I hadn't watched that game. I watched that game this morning. Oh, the yeah. Titans D-line beat the hell out of Joe Burrow, like early and often. And so Richardson's going to have his hands full. He's not going to have a ton of time to throw. He is going to take a bunch of hits. I'm a little bit worried about that because he's already missed time this season. That was from, I'd say, a little over-aggressiveness early in the first game or two, trying to do the rookie prove-it thing. I'll show you, big NFLers. I'm not afraid of you. Got knocked out of a couple of games. Like, okay, like, knock that off. <laughs> you don't yeah. need to prove it. Like You, don't, you don't. don't need to be Cam Newton all over again, man. Yeah. Please, <laughs> please don't. Like, Two games is fine. Stop that. But uh, regardless of wanting to stop that, Titans D line is gonna gonna eat in this one. They are extremely good. Um, they had great success last week. I expect them to have good success again this week. That doesn't mean they're gonna win. That just means that Richardson's gonna have to have even more heroics, and he can do it. Um, but Titans DL is no joke, and they they mashed Burrow. Now Burrow can't move as much with his calf right now, but. You know, the Bengals know that too, and they've been trying to get the ball out quick and protect him. That was, they didn't protect him at all last week. He just got he got slammed like three or four times. Um, so I would expect to see some hits on Richardson in this one. He's big enough to take it. Um, but Titans are gonna bring and get pressure on Richardson, and that's gonna make it, you know, exciting. <laughs> they do bring uh, 
you know, for, for having a defensive line as good as them, they do bring a lot of pressures, um, you know, bringing five and six bodies to give their guys one-on-one matchups, uh, which they will win most of the time. Um, but when I was going back and I was looking at all of the pressures they brought, because I was like, okay, you know, what what is the manner in which they bring them? Is it corners coming off the edge? Is it linebackers? Is, like, what what's, what's their style of blitzing? Uh, the answer is yes, it's all of it. <laughs> but situationally, uh, what what I found interesting it was mostly on early downs. So mm-hmm. they've had 28 rushes so far this year with five plus guys coming at the quarterback. Uh, 13 of them were on first down. 12 of them were on second down. Only three on third down, which to me signals we are playing the run on the way to the quarterback. We are trying to generate negative plays. We are trying to basically ruin your drive on first down because statistically, and this is kind of a, a thing that I've, I've seen a lot of analytics folks um, really talk about lately, not to get too much on a tangent, but it is important. And I've been thinking about doing a video on it, <laughs> but first down um, in a lot of ways is the most important down, not third down. Brent Venables recently echoed that in an interview that if you can get a negative play on first down, yeah. statistically the, success rate for a drive plummets because if you can if you can get them into like second and 13 by getting a tackle for loss or a sack or any sort of negative play it completely throws out like 80 percent of the playbook you know and it it basically takes the run game out of the equation which Mm -hmm. if you can take the run game out of the equation on second down not just third down that means that a if you have another blitz that you want to call on a, in a long yard situation, you can. But B, it means that your defensive line can play faster and they can just rush and your secondary can play faster and not really have to key the run that hard on second and on second down, right? Yeah. And so if if your defensive line is teeing off and you force a quick throw, even if they gain five or six yards, you're still in third and seven and you're in mm-hmm. business, right? Compared to third and two. So analytically speaking, what a lot of stats people are saying is that the most important thing you can do is generate a negative play on either first down preferably or second down because that is single-handedly the best way to kill a drive. If you're not being aggressive on early downs, it uh, statistically you open yourself up to a lot more third and shorts, which we know that the success rate on converting those is way, 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 way higher, which means you're on the field longer, which increases your exposure to explosive plays, which then increases your exposure to red zone appearances, which then increases your exposure to points. So the most important thing you can do, and the Titans live and die by this, is sell out, get a negative play on first down. How does this affect the Colts? If I'm Shane Steichen and I'm looking at those numbers, which I know he is, because if I'm looking at him, I know he's looking at him. If I'm Shane Steichen, I introduce the screen game into the game plan early, mm. like early, like one of one of the first plays you call, especially, you know, if you can hit them with a hard count and you see they're coming, yeah. you then get into a screen because uh, you know that they're going to be coming. Uh, and if you can just slow down the blitzes by calling stuff that punishes blitzes, even if it doesn't work. If you just show, Hey, we're going to call screens on first and second down. They're not going to call blitzes anymore. And if they're not calling blitzes anymore, now you can actually get into the run game. Now you can actually get into the play action pass game. Now you can do all the stuff that you want to do to protect this young quarterback, but you have to discourage the blitzing first. So if I'm Steichen, Whatever whatever my favorite screen call is that I think we can hit, I'm calling that on like the first or second drive because I got to set the tone of like, you're not bringing six bodies against us on first down or we will punish you for 30 yards. And once they do that, all bets are off. It completely ruins what the Titans have been doing this entire year. It forces them on their back foot and, uh, and we'll see if they can handle the Anthony Richardson show when they're on their back foot. <laughs> It'll be interesting. If you think about the sort of logic of that, create an explosive defensive play on first down and just flip it, it's what offenses have tried to do forever. If you can get a chunk, if you can get five or six five or six yards on first down as an offense, 
Mm-hmm. You're good. Your playbook does the opposite, right? It opens. You can use more plays on second down. You can take a shot if you want to. You can use something short yardage to keep your drive going. You, you can do anything, and that makes it more difficult for the defense to defend because the defensive playbook gets limited, if you will, because you've picked up a bunch of yards on first down. So again, it's just like a really high leverage down. If the offense does well, their drive's more likely to succeed. If the defense does well, the drive's less likely to succeed for the for the opposing offense. So it's just a very high leverage down and people putting more focus on it and not saying, hey, all right, we'll just, whatever, hold up through first and second down and then we'll, we'll play hard on third down. No, a lot of a lot of teams are trying to force the issue um, on both sides of the ball earlier in the set of downs. Makes perfect sense. Um, as far as the Colts, I you know you say the the screen game, and I agree because if you're just running Zach Moss <laughs> into those <laughs> blitzing fronts, it's not going to look great. But I do look for them to lean on Moss, whether it's in you know the screen game, flare game, getting him outside of that. Um, putting Josh Downs in motion through the slot, especially, like you said, if there's a blitz indicator, like have him in the slot. Hey, if you see that, motion him, put him on short motion behind the quarterback and and just get him outside, little flare pass, right? Get him through some trash, make it so there's kind of a natural pick with those defenders coming downhill and, and just flick it, right? Get it mm-hmm. get it outside. Limit your, limit your hits on Richardson because it's a very fast developing play. Get it into your running back's hands. Basically, shuff some of the hits off onto him. Um, but again, you can't just run right up the middle, especially against that defensive line. Add a you know, add a backer, add a safety, because again, those blitzes coming in, you, you're going to get negative plays on first down. Then you're going to have to play behind the sticks. Then it's going to be you know Richardson. We talked about hero ball at the top with Trevor and Josh. It's the same thing. He's still a rookie. You don't want him you know trying to cape up for three quarters of the plays like probably not going to go super well if that happens yeah it went decently well against the rams but uh the titans defense is is a little bit tougher overall uh it's they got dudes they really got dudes um i will say for my underdog slip um there was a bunch of interesting names to choose from in this one Uh, i ended up going with with michael Pittman over at 59 and a half receiving because in my head i was like okay if they do get success on early downs and discourage these blitzes, mm-hmm. what then will be the game plan that they settle into? Right. And what do they want to do? For me, <laughs> yeah, what do they want to do? Mm-hmm. For me, I'm like, okay, uh, it'll be play action crossers to Pittman. It'll be RPOs probably to Pittman. Uh, it'll be, you know, uh, bootlegs where we get Pittman on a shallow like they, they feed him the ball at every single level of the field right yeah. and when they're in the red zone where are they throwing a lot of the time Pittman <laughs> so like it's it, it's very much a, a a wide receiver one situation not a 1a and 1b like a lot of teams like Pittman is the wide receiver one Alec Pierce has been a lot less involved than I thought he would be uh, then again I know Richardson was was out for a significant chunk of snaps, but I, I really thought Pierce was going to be, um, I, th- I really thought Pierce was going to be more involved as like a, a vertical threat down the boundary. So far, it's just been the Pittman show, and I I do feel like that's going to continue again this week. So I'm going higher on him, and again, it's like less than sixty yards. So I feel like, in terms of the average of what Pittman's giving us this year, other than last week. But in terms of the average of what he's giving us this year, that seems like a pretty, pretty easy number for me. I wish there were a catches number because, again, with his focus, he is leading in touches and targets by a lot. Not necessarily in yards or yards per catch. That's the Pierce show and sometimes Josh Downs. He's he's solid there, but he's not this huge explosive play threat but they throw him the ball like 11 times a game like it is a very mm-hmm. clear so give me the catches number i'll take the, i'll take the over on catches unless you're saying like 12 right other than that i would take the over on catches yards they've been variable for Pittman. sometimes he's had you know games where he's averaged like six seven yards per but he's had eight touches um 
And then sometimes it's stretched out a little bit longer than that, but he's always getting a high number of, you know, targets and catches because they do, they focus on him very much as their one a. So, uh, I think it's fine betting on him either way. I'd rather take the catches number if they give it to me rather than the yards number. But you know, again, that's not a huge yards number. Yeah. So far he's averaging, uh, just a little under 10 targets a game and he's averaging seven catches a game. So it's, yeah, he's got the volume on his yeah. side for sure. They're giving him giving him shots, flipping it over to the Titans' offense. One note: Tannehill peppered the middle of the field versus the Bengals. Look at his next gen pass chart. We might even throw it up for you. Um, he put a lot of stress on the inside linebackers, on the safeties coming down. Like he threw a ton of balls against the Bengals last week to the middle of the field, more than I've seen a quarterback throw in quite some time. Certainly more than I've seen him throw uh, in quite some time. So uh, he's going to be you know, putting some stress on Zaire Franklin and the other inside backers, but Franklin's been great so far this year. So that's a, a fun matchup is like, Hey, let's, let's see what happens over the middle of the field. If you add up uh, all uh, of the, the, the cover three, as well as, um, you know, PFF, when they do their coverage data, they separate out cover three versus cover three seam. It's basically a different version of cover three. That's mm-hmm. less often played, but, um, Gus Bradley is, is especially fond of it. But if you add up three and three seam in terms of total percentage of snaps, total percentage of coverage snaps, they run those two coverages 65% of the time. You know, it's, they are a cover three team. They have always been a cover three team under Bradley. They always, I'm talking like literally every year of his tenure, are number one in cover three. That is what they do. You know, they don't blitz. They play that coverage. They'll mix in like a little bit of quarters. They'll mix in a little bit of cover two. They'll play cover one like 7% of the time. But they they play cover three. And they <laughs> say, go ahead, beat us. Yep. For Tannehill specifically, in terms of how he would beat them, or rather how the Colts would expect him to try to beat them, I'm not sure he has enough gas in his arm to do it, right? Because they're going to play really tight tight thirds meaning they're not going to give a they're not they're not just bailing and being like eight yeah. yards over the top of the receiver right they're going to play tight and they're going to have their eyes on the quarterback while while maintaining position over the top but not too far over the top because yeah. they know that Tannehill doesn't have the gas to really challenge them over the top so they're going to play it tighter wait for the comeback wait for the deep out and at that point it's a race you know because they know that route is coming it's all it's all he can throw but he's not throwing it with the same gas that he did earlier in his career so it's like can you trust Tannehill to throw deep outside the numbers against a corner that knows you're not throwing deep, deep outside the numbers, <laughs> knows, knows that you're throwing intermediate outside the numbers where they can drive on it? Does he have the gas to get it there before the corner does? I'm not so sure that he does. You know, does he have the gas to hit a seam route before the free safety closes it down? I'm not sure that he does. So, yes, the Colts are sometimes appropriately criticized for playing the same (laughs) coverage all day, every day. But at the same time against quarterbacks like Tannehill, it tends to work because you got to have the talent to beat it. You know, the the entire Legion of boom was built off of that. Unless Mm -hmm. you had a gun where you could hit those windows and they were very small windows against the Legion of boom. But if you didn't have the arm to hit it, you were screwed. And I'm not sure that Tannehill anymore has the arm to hit it. So if I had to pick a winner in this game, it's Indy. Not by much, but I do think it's Indy. And um, hopefully we get to see Anthony Richardson do something cool along the way. Yeah, it's Indy if Richardson stays upright. <laughs> I'll, I'll put mm-hmm. that up as a caveat. If he's if he's on his back five times in the first quarter and a half, like they're probably not winning this game. Yeah. But it should be fun. AFC South oh, is fun this year, man. I like it. They're they're an entertaining abs- division. Absolutely be fun. I you know, I did not expect the Titans to play the game against the Bengals last week that they did. They played a great game. They look like a very complete team. Derrick Henry was back running over people. Um Tajay Spears had a couple of out of nowhere. He had a almost fumble that turned into like an eleven yard gain. Um You know, the one ball, it's interesting you talk about throwing deep outside the numbers, like the one deep-ish ball that he hit down the right side was a 50-50 ball to D-Hop, and like D-Hop won it, but it was not a clear, like, I'm throwing it over the corner's head, leading the guy by, you know, two, three steps. So, again, it's, you know, 
each team sort of has to play within themselves and, and play to their strengths and both of them have strengths and it'll be fun to see, you know, which strengths went out. That Titans D line is, is a tough unit to bet against any week of the year because they bring it. All right, let's get to the parting glass here. Last segment of the show where we, uh, we have a quick parting thought that maybe we either, we couldn't fit into the rest of the show or, Maybe just doesn't have anything to do with the rest of the show, but we wanted to get it out there anyway. Uh, EJ, what is your parting glass for the week? One of the reasons the Bucks for the for the Bucks surprising start turnovers. They've grabbed ten, six picks, and four fumbles so far. It's an extra two and a half possessions a game. That's impressive. Uh, the other reason, new offensive coordinator Dave Canales knows what he has in Baker Mayfield, and he's asking him to play within that. Now, you might say. Well, aren't all coaches supposed to do that, EJ? Yes, they are. Do they? (laughs) No, they don't. Um, But the results have been really good so far and way better than expected. Baker's eighth in QB rating ahead of Goff, Geno, Dak, Hurts, Mahomes, and he's seventh in QBR if that's your jam. Um, It has been a very happy marriage so far uh, in the early going for a team that a lot of people thought were going to be you know, cratering for Caleb or just looking for a high pick and, and weren't going to be competing. Um, Canales has, I think, a really good finger on the pulse of what Baker is and is not and is asking him to take shots in the appropriate way and limiting the shots where he is not so good. And that has been getting the best out of the Bucks team in general with those extra possessions that the defense is creating through turnovers. So nice marriage going on in Tampa Bay early on. It's still the honeymoon period, but uh, it's looked pretty good so far. Uh, Canales was widely seen as uh, an instrumental figure in uh, in bringing back Geno Smith from the depths, right? Um you know, he was the wide receivers coach in Seattle for a while, and then he became the quarterbacks coach, mm-hmm. and then the passing game coordinator when Geno got there. And uh, he's the passing game coordinator when Geno came in in that one year where uh, where Russ was injured, and everybody's like, "Oh, okay, wow, Geno looks actually pretty good, hmm, good okay. again, yeah, huh, yeah." Weird. And then he was the he was the quarterbacks coach in 2022 uh, last year when Geno went off, and everybody's like, "Whoa, okay, <laughs> Geno is really good now." And and then of course he got hired to be the OC by Tampa, coming off of that. Uh, resurrection, so to speak, of Gino. <laughs> and so far, he's working very similar magic on Baker. So perhaps Dave Canales uh, is a pretty damn good football coach. Folks. He's going to be and getting some interviews at the end of this year. If oh, this continues, yeah, he <laughs> he's, he's going to be this year's Ben Johnson. Ben Johnson is still going to be the overall leading candidate. A lot of us thought he would be leaving last year. He came back. Canales could be very similar. I might, I'm, I could see Canales taking some interviews and maybe saying, "Hey, if it's not the right spot, I'll go back to what is a good spot for me in Tampa, strengthen my resume, and then come out next year as as the top sort of offensively minded candidate in the coaching side." Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, all right, my parting glass. I I could have included these when we were talking Eagles Rams, but. I felt it was better to put it here because it's more throwaway notes. But I want to talk about two young players who most people either don't know their names or don't hear them very often. That's Reed Blankenship for the Eagles and Kobe Turner for the Rams, who's their rookie DT. Reed Blankenship, I think, is their second year safety. I remember we saw him at Shrine Bowl a couple years ago, I think it was. Um, But he is tied for first among all safeties in forced incompletions with four. He also has a really, really nice pick. Uh, when uh, I think he got it a couple weeks ago, you know, he sacrificed his arm against Terry McLaurin last week to keep his foot, allegedly keep his foot allegedly. from hitting inbounds. Sorry, Commanders fans, don't want to bring that up again. But um, he's played very, very good football and turned into a really mm-hmm. nice player for them. And then uh, Kobe Turner, ironically, also another Shrine Bowl alum uh, who we talked to this past year at this year's Shrine Bowl has also come on the scene really quickly for the Rams. He is fourth among rookie DTs in pass rush win rate. He has four run stops already, been a really nice contributor on early downs for them. And uh, for a defense that was in desperate need of young rotational players to, to be successful early, he has been successful early. And I want to emphasize they were desperate to get production out of their young guys because they had so many young guys. But uh, so far, Kobe Turner looks like a hit. Smart guy. Great guy to talk to. 
Uh, also a very good and impactful football player, smart on the football field as well. Um, talk about football intelligence. His football intelligence is very, very high. That was very clear very quickly in our conversation with him. His intelligence off the football field is also very high. Great guy, great great dude to talk to. And Reed Blankenship um, was one of those guys that um, decided to go back. He had a chance to come out. He went to Middle Tennessee and uh, had a great year. And I thought he was going to enter the draft, decided to go back for another year, ended up having a bit of a down year and, and people kind of lost track of him. Uh, but the year before that had been incredibly productive. I was really excited to see where he was going to go in the draft. And he, you know, it's just one of those players that for whatever reason decided to go back had a bit of a lag, but now, you know, played some decent football last year, but this year is really sort of settled in, feels comfortable, is making an impact, and really looks more like he did in that second to last year of college at Middle Tennessee State, where he was just a force, both against the run in the past, really good size, um, you know, almost linebacker like size, could play light linebacker if you wanted him to this year, making plays, great to see. Uh, one more time recap of the underdog slip, slip for the week. Excuse me, if you guys want to tail it and or fade it, because <laughs> you know me, probably a better idea to fade it. Uh, we got over one and a half field goals for Brett Maher. We have under 62 and a half rushing for Travis Etienne. We have higher on 41 and a half receiving for George Kittle. We have higher on 53 and a half receiving for TJ Hawkinson. And we have higher on 59 and a half receiving for Michael Pittman. Thank you once again to Underdog for sponsoring this entire show. Uh, we we really do appreciate the partnership. They've funded us for two years and let us keep doing this twice a week, every week. Uh, couldn't be more grateful to them. Uh, if you guys also want to join Underdog to play along with us, again, you can use promo code BOOTLEG at the description below, and that will double your deposit up to 100 bucks, and you get access to a, a mystery special uh, for the following week whenever, whenever you happen to do a deposit. Um, also want to thank Homage. For partnering with us uh we will have some very big news about that coming up fairly soon here we can't share it yet but it's insane and it's awesome uh but homage is uh the they, they actually make this hoodie that i'm wearing right now if you're watching the youtube version of this show they have hoodies shirts starter jackets pretty much anything for all of your your teams they have the nfl license so if you're looking to get some team gear this fall you know as the temperatures drop and you want to get yourself a new hoodie check out homage uh, everything that you you buy from them, we get a little piece of, so that also supports the show, and we thank them for working with us as well. Um, EJ, any parting thoughts before we get out of here? I just want to thank all of you out there who watch and listen to this show. Um, you've made us one of Homage's top 10 partners since we started um, collaborating with them uh, at this year's NFL Draft. And in a very short period of time, uh, we've sort of vaulted to the top of the rankings. And that is purely because you have been supporting our partners. It's a great way to support the show. It's great gear, but we couldn't do that without all of you. So thank you very much uh, for believing in us, believing in homage and, and supporting both um, makes a big difference. And uh, I know they're thrilled about it. We're thrilled about it. Again, we're going to have some super fun news because of that, but it's because of all of you. So thank you very much. I don't know if we'll ever catch new heights, but we'll try to get as close as we can. <laughs> I don't know. Um, you willing to? Anyways, nope, not going to say it. <laughs> well, am I willing to go date Taylor Swift? Yeah, I think I will, EJ. I My wife would understand. Uh, <laughs> she on your list? Uh, good. She should be. Well, <laughs> it's going to give me a million podcast downloads in a day. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Uh, anyways, the different ways to success, but, uh, they were successful before that on new heights and they are certainly successful since, uh, before we get out of here, I want to thank our executive producers for bootleg over on the executive producer tier on Patreon, Marat, Consti, Andrew, Liam, Connor, and Mike L. Thank you all once again for supporting us this month. Um, we'll be back. Let's see. This is coming out Friday recorded on Wednesday. So we'll be back Monday for our week five recap show. And then, of course, our TNF stream next week. Um, if you missed this week's TNF stream, which we haven't even done yet, Fitzy, of course, in true Fitzy fashion, sent me a bottle of Malort for the Bears game <laughs> that we're going to have to sit through tomorrow. And I think, uh, EJ, I had a thought that every oh. time the Bears do something embarrassing, I'm going to take a shot of Malort. Oh, and then. Good God, we'll, no. We'll see where I'm at by the end please, of the game. <laughs> please don't do that. 
That is a terrible pregame plan. I'm just going to like, I'm on record. Well, this is coming out afterwards. You'll all know how it worked out already by the time you watch this, but please don't do that. That's a terrible idea. You know, it's, it's the only way to properly celebrate Bears football is just oh, getting completely man. blacked out on Malort. I, like a true oh, Bears fan. Okay. So hopefully I'm alive to do the week five recap show. If not, see you in the afterlife. Uh, We appreciate you watching and listening. And uh, ideally, at least one of us will see you next week.